Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for what will be a fascinating Grand Rounds webinar co-hosted by the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for the Environment and Health and our MGH Institute of Health Professions Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice and Health. And as many of you know, we are part of Mass General Brigham, which has launched impressive initiatives around climate and sustainability. And my name is Winnie Armand, and I'm a physician at the Mass General, the Division of General Internal Medicine at Mass General, and uh, a member of the Center of the, uh, for the Environment and Health. Um, we are so thrilled to be co-sponsoring these monthly webinars with you, uh, focusing on issues at the intersection of climate, the environment, and health. Um, and I think um, the number of registrants that we've had for this talk is a testament to how much we understand that this is a critical and very important topic, as well as a testament to what an important speaker that we have with us today. Um, we're really lucky to have Mr. Gary Cohen with us. Um, just a few housekeeping issues before I introduce our speaker. Uh, closed caption is available. Uh, this will. Uh, this is. Uh, enabled by uh, Michael Buznak, who is um, the man behind everything that is happening behind the scenes to put these webinars together successfully. Uh, he also will manage to have this recorded and emailed to you probably by the end of the day. So if you have to leave at some point, uh, never fear, you can see the whole recording uh, later on. The other thing to note is that we do have the Q&A, so please feel free to put in your questions and towards the latter half of this hour, uh, we will try to address as many as that, uh, questions that you have as we can. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Gary Cohen. He's really been a pioneer in the environmental health movement for more than 35 years. I suspect that many of you have heard him speak or know him well for the work that he has done. Um, he has built coalitions and networks globally to address health impacts related to climate change and toxic chemical exposure. Uh, Mr. Cohen is the co-founder and president of Healthcare Without Harm, which was created in 1996 and really has transformed the healthcare sector to be more environmentally sustainable um, and is very supportive of climate resilience in the communities that we serve. Uh, this nonprofit has grown and partnered to groundbreaking initiatives in more than 70 countries. Uh, Mr. Cohen was awarded the Champion of Change Award for Climate Change and Public Health by the White House, as well as received a MacArthur Fellowship. And so I cannot thank Mr. Cohen enough for joining us this hour. Thanks so much, Winnie, and thanks for having me at this webinar. Um, I want to start by just telling you my early experiences uh, with the healthcare sector, which had a profound impact on my life. Uh, when I was 12, my dad was having symptoms of uh, dizziness and unsteadiness. And um, they had just come back, my parents had just come back from a vacation after the tax season, he was an accountant. Um, and so he went to the hospital for tests. Uh, and the next day, uh, he died from uh, a medical error. I was 12. And then two years later, my brother, uh, who was at the time six, um, was taking his bike out of the driveway and was hit by a car uh, as it was speeding down the street. And he was knocked up terribly and was in a coma for uh, 18 days. And everybody thought that he was gonna die, including the, the doctors. And um, there was this moment where he was laying in the coma and I, I, he, had, he had told me this, you know, this little joke that first graders tell. It's like, you know, put your hand in here and swish it around. And the joke is, thanks for cleaning my toilet bowl. And so he was laying there and I just thought, maybe I'll do this. And so I, I did this. I took his hand, I put my finger in there and I said, thanks for cleaning my toilet bowl. And he started to laugh. And it was the thing that actually brought him out of his coma. And uh, miraculously, he, 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 he lived and he's still alive today. And so from a very early age, I learned that hospitals were both really dangerous places, 
uh, but also places where miracles could happen. And that's kind of the frame of how I think about this. Um, uh, the way I got involved in, in, in environmental health issues was, um, was years later, um, after the uh, Bhopal chemical disaster, a Union Carbide pesticide factory blew up in December of 1984 uh, across the whole city of Bhopal and it released all these poisonous gases. And within one night, 3,000 people had died and half a million people were exposed uh, to these toxic gases that had long-term health impacts. And that was a huge awakening around the world because uh, people in America, people around the world said, well, there's, there's a chemical factory right down the street from me. I wonder if that kind of disaster could happen uh, in my community. And that was an impetus for what was then a grassroots movement uh, that was growing in the United States, people that were living around uh, toxic waste sites, people that were living around incinerators, people that were living around uh, polluting factories. And they said, we have a right to know, we should know what are the toxic chemicals that are going into the land, going into our water, going into our air that may be impacting our children. And so I got involved in this burgeoning movement um, that won uh, the first right to know, national right to know law in the country, actually in the world, and also established this idea that polluters should pay for their, uh, their pollution in our communities. Uh, we shouldn't be having to pay the, the social and environmental costs for pollution. Um, as we built an organization around these concepts, around right to know, um, we noticed and we're observing that many of these dumps, many of these incinerators, many of these uh, polluting facilities, they were located in poor white uh, and, and uh, people of color communities all around the country in particular. Um, and so the link between racial, racial inequities and environmental pollution was, was very clear and very cemented. Uh, the United Church of Christ did an analysis that said, um, the majority of, of toxic dumps are in, uh, in communities of color. So fast forward um, to uh, middle of the 1990s. And at that time, there was new science coming out that said that um, low doses of toxic chemical exposure, especially in the first thousand days of life, in the womb and in the first couple of years of life, could have a profound impact on the development of the child. Um, and, that, and that chemicals were acting as sort of disrupting the hormones, turning them on and off, that could interfere with critical windows of development. And so we thought, those in, our, in the movement thought, oh my God, that's gonna change everything. Because it's not just you know, a large dose of chemicals that might contribute to cancer in one in a hundred thousand people or one in a million people, but it was actually um, messing with the basic development of, 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 of life. Um, and we said, well, you're gonna have to, it's gonna have to change a lot of different things. And the, the two chemicals that were being looked at that had that kind of hormone disrupting power, one was dioxin, which isn't produced intentionally. It's the it's the result of producing chlorinated pesticides and, and PVC plastics and the result of burning, uh, burning chlorinated plastics, et cetera. Um, and the other was mercury. Um, mercury, which is a neurotoxin. And if it gets into a mom and then into the child, it could have an impact on their brain development, neurological development, IQ development. At the very same time that this new science was emerging, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency came out with a report and they said that medical waste incinerators were the largest source of dioxin emissions in the United States and a significant source of mercury emissions. And so those of us who were involved in trying to address these chemical exposure and health issues, we said, wait a second, the healthcare sector is the one sector of our society that's committed to healing. If they themselves are one of the largest polluters in the country, contributing to the very diseases that they're trying to solve for, what hope do we have, really, 
for changing the economy away from toxic chemicals if they're actually major perpetrators. So it was the impetus to then launch healthcare without harm. We said, we need to bring this latest science to the healthcare sector. Um, the latest science around toxic chemicals in health, the latest science around climate and health, the latest science around industrial food systems, pesticides and, and health. And that was the logic. And we said, given how powerful also, how powerful healthcare is as an economic engine in America, at that point it was think it was 15% of the entire economy. Now it's almost 20% of the economy. Is that we can leverage healthcare's embracing of these issues of racial equity and, and environmental health and have a broader effect on the larger society. And so we started with these two issues. When we started the organization, there were about 4,500 medical waste incinerators in the country. Almost every hospital had one. Mass General had one, um, in fact. Uh, there were about 35 of them around the state. And within 10 years, there were less than 100 incinerators left. And we had taught healthcare how to address their waste, you know, how to reduce the amount of infectious waste, how to uh, reuse certain things, how to recycle certain things, how to reprocess some medical devices so we're not throwing things away after use or no use, how to use alternative technologies like autoclaves uh, to render uh, infectious to, uh, waste inert, how to save money in the process. And we had um, gotten uh, initially one hospital in Boston uh, to commit to eliminate uh, mercury, and then all the hospitals in Boston, uh, and then all the hospitals in the country, and then all of the pharmacy chains. And then we had gotten uh, the European Commission uh, to support, uh, European Parliament also to support a phase out of mercury uh, measuring devices in Europe. And then we started with one hospital in the Philippines. We started with another hospital in Buenos Aires and partnered with the World Health Organization. And in about 15 years, we won a global treaty phasing mercury out of healthcare. So these were like the early efforts to bring a, in a very targeted way, environmental health issues to the doorstep of healthcare to say, you've got a problem, but you know what? If we work together, we can solve it together. And we have enormous amount of power and we have enormous amount of expertise. Let's bring it to these issues. And so we started there and showed that you can win at a very large scale from one hospital to a global treaty in mercury. And we said, okay, let's look deeper. What else is there to do? And we said, okay, well, there's plastics that are being used in, in healthcare. And some of those plastics like PVC plastics, they actually leach toxic chemicals into our vulnerable patients. And those toxic chemicals, they leach into the patients, they're reproductive toxins called phthalates. And in fact, uh, physicians at, at the Brigham uh, said, we get this. And they said, we're gonna move away from PVC plastics for our IV bags and, and, and a number of other equipment that has an impact on, on vulnerable patients. Why would we be infusing neonatal intensive care unit patients or pregnant women with a reproductive toxin. It makes no sense whatsoever. And it turns out that those materials are also in our building materials and et cetera. And so there was moves to sort of address chemicals in products. And we said, what about the buildings? Some of these buildings have no windows. So, so uh, nurses and doctors and others are laboring for 12 hour shifts with no light. It's as if the, the buildings themselves were on life support systems. Not healthy places for either patients or for our employees. And so we sort of challenged the, the, the sector, said, can you build cancer centers without carcinogens? Can you, can you build children's hospitals without chemicals linked to birth defects? And lots of healthcare architects got together and said, we can do all this. We can create more natural light that's good for people. It helps people leave hospitals sooner. It's good for the healing process. It's good for people's cognitive ability, for the doctors and nurses and, and employees. Uh, we can make more energy efficient buildings. We can detox our buildings and make them environments that actually promote healing. Views of nature promote healing. 
And so uh, there was a huge movement in the country and now around the world to design healing environments in our facilities. And then we said, what about the food? Nobody's really thinking that food is very good when you go to a hospital. In fact, a lot of the food that was being served were uh, junk food, you know, sugar sweetened beverages, food that actually contributed to the epidemic of food related diseases that we see, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, stroke. So we said, we need to transform the food practices and the purchasing practices of healthcare to move away from these. Uh, we're buying meat that is produced with the overuse of antibiotics that are making the antibiotics in our, uh, in our treatment of, of uh, disease uh, ineffective. So connecting what we buy with our clinical care was an, a, crucial, a crucial connected point. Um, and physicians were advocates for, we, yeah, we can't be, you know, we got to buy meat that's produced in more sustainable ways. We could, in fact, we should be supporting more plant-based diets that are good for people's health, good for the planet, um, and, uh, and good for the climate. And in fact, it costs less money. And so the, the, the role to come to the issue of, of um, climate and health was actually not in the beginning. When we started in 1996, it, Al Gore was talking about climate um, uh, and some scientists, but it wasn't forward in any way in healthcare. It wasn't what people had in their minds. It wasn't in our minds. And so we came to this issue of climate and health probably uh, 15 years into our work. Um, so maybe 10 years ago. And as the climate crisis has unfolded, now we see how central it is to everything else. So we did an analysis um, that said uh, that uh, healthcare is, is contributing about four and a half percent of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and inside of that, the United States healthcare system is 27% of all global in, uh, healthcare emissions. To put that in perspective, if healthcare was a country, global healthcare, it would be the fifth largest climate polluter in the world. It's the equivalent of the annual emissions of over 500 coal fire power plants. So that's a really important piece because climate is the force multiplier for everything else, for all of the racial and economic inequities that we face in our society, uh, for all of the other problems, we're seeing that climate is, is exacerbating every other problem that we face in, in, uh, around the world. And at the center of that problem is fossil fuels. And fossil fuels have a, have a really central place in this larger unfolding drama. One is that just the emissions from fossil fuels and it's linked to particulate matter, according to the uh, recent study of the Harvard Center um, at, at the School of Public Health at Harvard, fossil fuels killed 8 million people globally in 2018. It's not even, related to its climate impact. That's just its, its air pollution impact. Secondly, it's the leading cause of the driver for the climate crisis. So it has a dual function. Three, the fossil fuel industry has also uh, polluted our science by manufacturing doubt. And there's a number of states now that are, uh, that are suing uh, the fossil fuel industry for having lied about climate change, uh, lied about their own impact, created the doubt that saying, well, we need to study this for another 20, 30 years. You know, we, we're not certain. It's not, it's not a settled matter. Paid researchers, and then also they polluted our democracy, honestly, uh, with campaign contributions and endless amounts of money that are making politicians handmaids to their continued dominance in the political process. So fossil fuels, is at the center of our collective wound. And what we've also realized is that climate change doesn't affect everybody equally. We're seeing 
the dramatic impacts now of, of extreme heat in the Northwest and wildfires in California and Montana. And today, flooding, uh, wild, uh, fl flooding and hurricanes in Louisiana and Texas, extreme heat all over the country and all over the world. So we're seeing all this play out. The people that are most affected are the people that have the least ability to be resilient in the face of it. So people who have already been exposed to uh, air pollution, more likely to have an impact. People who can't afford to have air conditioning, more likely to have impact. People who are living on diesel truck routes, who are living next to some of these really polluting factories, likely to have a more significant impact. There's been studies now in Boston and elsewhere that show that even in many, many cities, the amount of, of tree cover in communities of color is far less than the white neighborhoods. It's, it's the inequality of heat. And in some places, it could be five or 10 degrees hotter in the same city because of tree cover, because of all the red lining that's happened over years. So all these issues are connected. COVID plays into this as well. You're more likely to have an extreme reaction to COVID if you've already got respiratory problems. That means the people in polluted neighborhoods are going to have more uh, likelihood of a severe reaction. So where does that leave us now? This summer was the hottest summer on record. Last year, there were 22 disasters uh, that cost more than $1 billion. The costs of, of fossil fuel uh, reliance and the costs of climate change are accelerating dramatically. Two weeks ago, UNICEF said that 1 billion children are at risk for their lifetime, their health, because of climate change. So what does the Hippocratic Oath mean in this moment of crisis? When the climate crisis is impacting 1 billion children, if, if, if as the UN um, refugee uh, organization is saying that climate refugees will outstrip war refugees in the next couple of decades, what does it mean when children are being born with toxic chemicals in their bodies, like ticking time bombs that may lead to chronic disease later in life? What is the role for the healthcare sector? What does it mean that all these racial inequities are being multiplied by this climate crisis? Um, what does it mean if we don't solve this our reliance on fossil fuels in the next decade that scientists uh, internationally are saying that we're, we, are, we are creating the conditions from a, for a public health holocaust a couple, of gen, a couple of decades from now. The healthcare sector has a fundamentally central role in addressing this crisis. And I'll say the three roles that, that healthcare or the harm believes strongly uh, that it needs to play. One is that it needs to anchor the response. It needs, to, it needs to be the last building standing in extreme weather events. When there's a hurricane, when there's flooding, it needs to make sure that it can operate if the grid fails. The Spalding Rehab Hospital was designed in Boston with that in mind. All the, all the electrical equipment is in the roof. The combined heat and power of this facility that allows it to operate if the grid fails, is, is in the roof. Boston Medical Center has a black start capacity that not only will allow the hospital to operate uh, if the grid fails, but also the, 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 the emergency communication system for the whole city of Boston. So the infrastructure of healthcare needs to be hardened to address these new emergencies because they're gonna come. But it's not only the infrastructure, it's also about the people that we serve. Where is the vulnerability? in our communities? Who are the people that are on ventilators? Who are the people who are most at risk for flooding? Who are those populations, many of them in poorer communities, many of them in communities of color that we have to take care of because we have to take care of everybody. So being at the center of the resilience of communities, both infrastructure 
and community resilience is a central role. Where do people go in emergencies? Where did people run to after the Boston Marathon bombing? They ran to the hospitals. They need to operate. So that's one fundamental function. The second is that we have to decarbonize our entire healthcare system. We need to kick our addiction to fossil fuels. We need to become drivers for renewable energy, for moving away from petroplastics, from supporting, for supporting uh, more plant-based diets that are good for people's health and moving away from industrial agriculture and pesticides that are also weakening the, the fertility of the soil. Uh, we need to address the anesthetic gases that are in our hospitals. Some of them are 2000 times more potent than, than others and they're safer alternatives. There's so we need to show that as a sector, as almost 20% of the US economy and 10% globally, that we can be leaders in driving toward an economy where health and equity are built in as part of our DNA. That's what, that's what do no harm means. And we even have a role given how powerful we are as, as anchors in our communities. Mass General is the largest employer in Boston, the largest employer in the state. How can we leverage our purchasing power to support more approximate and sustainable agriculture, to partner with others, to build microgrids, to move the entire Boston economy and help raise people up, to contract with more people of color organizations and contractors? How can we, how can we heal racism to some extent and heal our addiction to an economy that has externalized harm? We have this unbelievable amount of power that we haven't even begun to leverage. It's not just our clinical power, it's our economic, it's our purchasing power, it's our workforce development, it's our investments. So how do we divest from fossil fuels? As Harvard just did last week, finally. Um, the third role is leadership. So, uh, we're the most trusted professions in America. Every year, the Gallup organization tells the poll, and they said, well, who do you trust the most? What profession do you trust the most? Nurses, doctors, pharmacists are some of the top three, along with firefighters. And we haven't, we're just beginning to leverage the role of trusted messengers. We see with COVID that doctors and nurses are trusted to say, here's the truth. No, don't inject yourself with some of these things that some potential politicians are telling you. Here's what it takes. Here's what masking does. Here's what taking the vaccine does. We're trusted messengers. We need to leverage that for this broader transformation to get involved in the policy space, to defend indigenous communities that are trying to block pipelines, to, to, to stop uh, uh, the fossil fuel industry from continuing to, to uh, drill and, and in the Arctic, et cetera. And the, the fact is that there's a lot of people stepping up within your own system. You have incredible leaders right here in Boston, Renee Salas and Ari Bernstein. Uh, you have John Mazervi, who's a leading architect at Mass General, Jonathan Slutsman, Regina LaRoque, Kate Walsh and Bob Biggio, Dave Mafio at Boston Medical Center, there's all these people that are stepping up now as leaders to say, we need to be part of a broader healing mission, not just our patients, but we need to heal our communities. We need to heal the planet. We need to operate at those three levels going forward and for all time. And what we've been able to do at Healthcare of the Harm is to help to create that momentum We've got 19 systems uh, who, are who are in a healthcare climate council who are committed to those three roles, resilience, decarbonization, and leadership. They represent over 600 hospitals in the country and they're the leading charge to bring the rest of the healthcare sector on board. Recently, there was a letter from 350 health-based organizations representing 40 million healthcare workers calling on world leaders to address the climate crisis as a, as a health issue, to reframe this crisis to be about people's health, things that matter to them, their personal lives, their families. Um, last week, there were 200 medical journals 
uh, who signed on to a, a letter calling for dramatic climate action. The National Academy of Medicine is launching later this month an action collaborative on climate and, and health. There's a new office at the Department of Health and Human Services on climate change and health equity. So the momentum around this is accelerating dramatically. And anybody who's in healthcare, we need you. We need you to be champions wherever you find yourself, whatever seat you are in your institutions. Uh, we need you to step up. We need you to show leadership in wherever you find yourself. And there's so many places to intervene in the system. I think the challenge that we have and the opportunity we have, especially here in Boston, is to make Boston the leading city in the world for climate resilience and health equity. You have incredible alignment. We have these institutions, Boston Medical Center, Mass General Brigham, Already, already engaged in, these, in this work in a very significant way. You have a foundation, the Barr Foundation, who is so totally committed to making Boston uh, a light for the entire world. You have strong NGO and community groups. We have um, incredible academic leadership led by the Harvard Center for Climate Change and Health. So we have all the conditions in this city. We have a Green Ribbon Commission of, key, of leading uh, real estate owners that are all working together to try to solve this. We have incredible opportunity to move Boston, to move the country and to move the world toward this transformation and to redefine the mission of healthcare in the 20th, 21st century. So that's the challenge and that's the offer I wanna make to all of you. And now I'm really happy to take questions and comments and let's talk about it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, very much. We have one question in the chat. Where can we find the concrete steps that need to be taken to achieve the, the goals that you set forth? Uh, certainly your organization uh, has very rich, robust resources. Would you like to comment on that further? Sure. Um, there is a slide that Michael's going to put up. Um, there you go. Um, that we just put up, it's called uh, healthcareclimateaction.org. And it, it, um, it identifies uh, the footprint analysis that we did. It, it identifies um, a, a framework, a climate challenge framework that integrates resilience and decarbonization and leadership. We developed a roadmap to decarbonize healthcare globally that lays out pathways around our energy, around our buildings, around our supply chain, around our investments or around our food uh, with a lot of uh, case studies and detail. Um, there is um, a number of networks uh, for health professionals to engage. Uh, we partnered with an organization called the Alliance of Nurses for a Healthy Environment on a nurses climate challenge. Lots of resources to educate nurses around the links between climate and health and ways for them to engage and interact. There's a physicians group uh, that we've created in, in Healthcare Without Harm uh, who are acting as leaders in their own institutions across a whole set of different strategies, but also in the public sphere. And, and we're certainly not the only ones doing this work. There's a uh, a, a new coalition called the Medical Society uh, Consortium on Climate and Health that has a lot of uh, different medical societies that have signed on to this agenda. The American Lung Association, Physicians for Social Responsibility. There's a number of groups who have resources. Um, and there's, uh, yeah, I mean, um, there's a lot of great research uh, at, at the Lancet. Um, and, and so many other uh, academic journals uh, that are now coming forward. The New England Journal of Medicine is starting to, to have different uh, kind of articles about this and op-eds about this and health affairs. There's no dearth of resources. If you want to get engaged, my goodness, there's lots of places to, to engage and there's a lot of resources that honestly, 10 years ago didn't exist. Um, 10 years ago, if we had tried to pull together a climate council of 19 healthcare systems, people said, look, we're too busy. It doesn't, it doesn't relate. We don't see the connection to us. 
but now people are seeing this connection. So there's lots of places to intervene and there's a lot of resources. So I hope that's, that helps to answer that question. Thank you. Then uh, another question, I liked that you talked about trust, but thinking about racial equity and climate health, what can we do to heal the mistrust brought about by medical racism? And I'll add Gary, in, in, from a nursing perspective, the future of nursing 2020 20 to 2030, uh, uh, the theme is charting a path to health equity. There's a, a really robust chapter about social determinants of health and um, climate change is embedded in there and nurses having roles both addressing health inequity around climate change. And that document is published by the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine and it's freely downloadable. So that's one great resource and taps into the question about racial equity. But uh, would you like to comment further about racial equity and, um, and um, how your efforts in your organization and other work that we can be doing in the healthcare community? Sure. Yeah, I mean, um, trust is built by um, doing things and talking to people. Um, we can go at the speed of trust, I think. And I think part of, part of the, the reckoning for the healthcare sector is moving away from uh, this idea of saving the community, that the community is only got deficits. It's only got health issues. The community health needs assessment that are part of every nonprofit hospital's commitment uh, under the Affordable Care Act. It just looks at deficits. It looks at where the health impacts are, which is important. It's crucial to know where the vulnerabilities are in the community, but it's not enough. We need to be looking at where are the assets in the community, where's the knowledge. People know what they need in many, many cases. And so moving away from we're going to save you, we're going to do to you, more like we're going to partner with you. We're going to be your partners. We have assets to bring. We have gifts to bring. We have resources to bring. We have knowledge to bring. And the community does too. And coming together and in a, in a kind of in a way that we acknowledge that we have, we in healthcare are like the 800 pound gorilla in many places. We need to come with greater humility and say, we wanna hear from you. What are the problems that you have? What are the things that you need? What are the assets that you bring um, to the table? And I think there's a, there's a group that we've been part of called the Healthcare Anchor Network that's looking at this larger role that and, and Healthcare Harm is doing it too. This larger role that we can play in addressing these multiple questions, both solving for the environmental health issues that we face in our communities, but solving for the economic inequities, solving for the racial inequities, and coming together to kind of work it out together. I think that's the way to do it. And we've been trying to pilot that um, in different places around, around the country where we create more of a level playing field um, to come and solve things together. Because it's not enough to say, we're just gonna solve uh, for climate. We have to solve for the health issues that we face, the epidemic of chronic disease. And we have to solve for the racial inequity. We have to solve for all these together. And there are solutions that, that bridge all these things together. And we need to pilot them all over the country and then scale them. Thank you. Gary, I just wanted to actually go back to some of the points you made earlier about the momentum. And I think you're right that there's incredible momentum and it's exciting and it's, it makes me feel very optimistic. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of ways to get involved. Um, I think that um, it makes sense sometimes to have, to be working in parallel because we have our own vulnerable communities here or our own hospital systems. At the same time, I feel like there are so many organizations that are doing very much the same and overlapping, and it seems very inefficient. Thoughts about, you know, the on an organizational level, how to be most effective? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, it's a good question. You know, we've had this view um, of social change um, 
which is kind of a network model. In other words, um, we don't need to have all the expertise in, in our organization. Uh, we don't, um, but there's expertise all over the place. And the question is to kind of build an ecosystem where that expertise gets lifted up in different places so that um, if somebody has expertise on how to address anesthetic gases in healthcare, as um, one of these anesthesiologists in Providence Healthcare did in Oregon, he said, fantastic, bring that to the, bring that to the table. And then we can get others to, to, to do that. Um, if some system is figuring out how to link feeding people uh, because people are hungry and therefore they're not going to be healthy. If you, if, you don't have, uh, if you don't have healthy food, you're just not going to be hungry. You're going to have chronic disease. You're going to have, uh, you know, you're going to go for junk food, which is going to con contribute to, to a whole set of issues. How do we link feeding people with supporting more sustainable local agriculture? If there's models out there that we're linking those things together, well, God, let's figure out how to scale that. So part of it is, is building an ecosystem where everybody gets a chance to contribute. We're not building a monolith. You know, there's never gonna be a, a, a building that says healthcare without harm. There's a global network that we've built now that, uh, as you said, it scales over 70 countries and has 1500 different partners around the world because we believe that there's expertise all over the place. And so we don't need to replicate stuff. We just need to raise it up. So that's, that's our approach. And it's not just about around environmental health, but if there's social investors who can partner with healthcare and say, well, I know how to, I know how to do more healthy housing, housing in Boston uh, that's affordable, that's climate resilient, that's energy efficient, bring it on, right? Because we have to solve all this together. So there's, there's a humility and a kind of partnership again that I think is a is a part of the DNA of how we need to work together. Gary, there are a few questions in the Q and A, and great interest in uh, the Q and A section. One person indicated that both as a workforce and hospital systems. What advice do you have about going to our hospital and colleagues to advocate for divesting from fossil fuels? And then a social worker inquired uh, that, or shared that the person had, has tried to engage local physicians to get involved as trusted leaders in our community, but to no response. Do you see a shift in that? Uh, for example, at Mass General, we now have the Center for the Environment and Health. And I, it seems as if interest is shifting, especially with the release of the sixth assessment report uh, from the intergovernmental panel what, that was released in August, and they called it code red for humanity. So I, could you offer some comments? Uh, sure, um, we'll leave, the, I'll say the, the investment thing in a second. I mean, yeah, I mean, People are seeing also in their own, you know, lived experience uh, that the climate crisis is accelerating all over the country. It, it, it's different and all over the world. It, it, it's different depending on where you live, whether it's heat or floods or hurricanes uh, or wildfires. But people's lived experience is changing. Um, and so the climate crisis, which was seen as so distant in time and space, well, doesn't it affect sort of polar bears on melting ice caps and glaciers, uh, that's shifted and it's come home to all of us. That's happening. And so that's fundamentally a, a, a fundamental shift. And thank God the, a, a lot of the reporting of meteorologists and newspapers saying, yeah, this is what climate change looks like. So that is shifting. And sure, the scientists are, are sounding this alarm and people are waking up. Um, you know, if, if for a couple of things about the physicians, our experience is that nurses uh, are more responsive than physicians, at least initially. Um, and so we've had a lot more success in really building up, you know, incredible activism among nurses in general, but the physicians are coming along. And I would say that these other organizations um, that are trying to 
to build us and others who are trying to build the movement inside of healthcare uh, for climate action may have may have contacts in your institution that you just don't know about or in related places in your city that you don't know about um, that can hook you up. Um, I, I think that we're seeing is that there's a, there's a much more engagement than before by a long shot. And it's, and, and I would say we're not living in a linear time frame anymore. We're living in an exponential time frame. So people's consciousness, global consciousness is shifting much faster uh, than a decade ago. And so th things that are things that were much more difficult uh, 10 years ago are getting easier. Um, people are waking up in a much more uh, ac accelerated way. So that's a hopeful sign. At the same time, it's getting a lot worse, a lot faster. So anyway, that's my thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. On the divestment question, um, you know, it's interesting. There's a debate about that. Um, I fall on the side of, of divesting um, from fossil fuels in the same way that we decided that tobacco wasn't a, a good thing. And, and many, many organizations, including many health organizations, divested from tobacco. It's inimical to the mission of healthcare to be investing in something that's killing millions of people around the world. We're in the healing business and fossil fuels is not in the healing business. And um, given the role that the industry has played in subverting um, uh, science, in subverting regulation, in subverting in many cases our democracy, I think we actually need to remove the social license from the fossil fuel industry in the way that we did around the tobacco industry, around also around those who promoted uh, the opioid epidemic. Um, I, there is an argument on the other side that, well, if we, if we have investments, we can influence the industry. Um, there's one example recently that suggests that there's a place in a very strategic way uh, to do so, which is there's a, an organization called Engine Number One that actually leveraged a whole bunch of socially responsible investors to, to, to get some progressive people on the Exxon board. It's an exception, honestly, and it's a strategic opportunity for a set of investors if that's where they wanna go. But in general, I think healthcare should be divesting from fossil fuels. It's actually one of the places um, that addresses its climate footprint. It's its investments as part of it. The supply chain is the biggest part, actually. The energy is there, but the supply chain is about 75% of all of healthcare's um, uh, climate footprint. Inside of that, it's also some of its investments. So I'm a fan of, of removing the social license of, of, of the industry, starving them so they can actually invest more and drill more um, in, 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 in places around the world. I think we have to keep fossil fuels in the ground uh, if we have any chance of surviving uh, as a species. Gary, do you mind if I jump in again and ask you a little bit about what you just said about our footprint? Um, I know you had said something about four and a half percent. I had have seen numbers upwards of 10 percent of mm -hmm. the greenhouse gas emissions coming from our healthcare system. Um, at the same time, I think about how much we can do for our patients now. You know, the, 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 as on an individual level, you know, the patients we have who are intubated with COVID pneumonia after a month and survive the, you know, whatever it may be, the transplants, pharmaceuticals, you know, which we haven't said that word yet, but is a huge part of that as well. So I think that um, in terms of doing no harm on, on when you take care of patients, it seems like they're, you know, we're at odds because we can offer so much and there's a reason why we're four to 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. And so balancing the, the technology and the pharmaceuticals with the global, you know, climate change issues is sort of uh, a struggle there. I wonder if yeah. you have thoughts about that. Yeah, of course, our, of course we have to, uh, our first, our first line of defense is to take care of the patient who comes to us. Absolutely, we can't sacrifice that, but I don't think it's, I don't think ultimately it's a contradiction. Um, the fact is um, we waste enormous amount of pharmaceuticals. There's an enormous amount of waste in the production of pharmaceuticals and the pharmaceutical industry knows this 
and is starting to realize that they also need to address their larger climate footprint. Um, we can run our facilities on renewable energy that um, cleans up the air, uh, reduces our climate footprint, reduces disease, saves us money. Um, there's many ways that we have enormous amount of waste in our system already. And that we've, and many of the systems that we've been working with around the country and around the world are showing that we can, we can do better healthcare delivery, better outcomes with less expense, um, and also be environmentally responsible. And even so, so I, I don't think it's a contradiction. There's some things we got to work out, right? We got to make sure that that we we do have the technologies that we need to take care of our patients. But I think we can also inspire and build the collective power of healthcare to say to the, to the supply chain, yes, we need these life-saving technologies and we need them to be more climate friendly, climate smart. And ultimately, I think we also need to move upstream because we so much of healthcare is waiting for people to show up at the emergency rooms. And if we move upstream and address the food insecurity and the poor food systems, the poor transportation, the poor housing in our communities. Those are the social drivers of health, the racism that locks people into poverty. Um, if we address those upstream factors, we in fact will do a great service to our patients and our communities because we'll be preventing disease and solving for these issues upstream. We spend so much of our, of our healthcare dollars at the end of the pipe, as it were. At the end, we're, we're fishing people out of the, the river as opposed to seeing why are they being thrown in the river in the first place? And we know that now. We know that the majority of the health impacts relate to the conditions that people face in their communities. We just need to move the dollars and our focus upstream to address those things. And then we'll really be serving people I think also it's hard to actually make those changes when you don't have the transparency about the supply chain and how do you make changes with how you're doing if you don't have the information when you don't have the information about the environmental toxic effects of you know most right. things that we're doing yeah no indeed and in, and in part of our strategy working with mass general and with all the larger systems and uh, around the country and around the world is that Healthcare systems have enormous power because of their economic power. And so getting them to make these broad climate goals, but also pressing on the supply chain and say, look, we're making these climate goals. We're going to be, we're going toward uh, the race to zero. We're going to be net zero emissions, but you supply chain companies, you have to come with us. You have to disclose to us the chemicals in your products. You have to disclose to us your own climate footprint because we can't actually get there unless you do it with us because of so much. So transparency, honesty in the supply chain is crucial to make this happen. And if the large systems in the country say, you have to do this, otherwise we're gonna go look somewhere else for somebody who can be more transparent, that leverage, that economic leverage will have a huge impact. We've seen, the way that we've made change happen is by aggregating the power of the largest systems in the country, building this collective will, and then driving the marketplace uh, toward those safer alternatives. We, that's what's worked. Thank God we now have a government that actually sees the power of, of healthcare playing this larger healing role. It's actually the first time uh, in my lifetime we've seen that. So there's an incredible alignment now between our strategies and the government strategies and all of government approach to, to a solving this. So we have, at least over the next three and a half years and hopefully longer, an amazing alignment um, in healthcare, in the government, and even at the international uh, climate treaty level uh, to move this agenda. Because the, the, the last thing is the presidency of the climate treaty negotiations is sitting with the British government now. The National Health Service in Britain, the National uh, Governmental Health Plan, has got the most ambitious climate goals of any national government in the country, in the world, I'm sorry. And they're now working with us 
and the World Health Organization to go to other governments around, around uh, the world saying, let's make healthcare the centerpiece. Let's make healthcare resilient to climate impacts. Let's make healthcare decarbonize um, uh, around the world uh, so that we are all moving in the same direction and healthcare can play this leading role in the global economy. So there's an amazing harmonic convergence that we've never seen before to accelerate progress. Thank you. Um, there's an awful lot of, I'm Barbara, and there's a lot of questions in terms of waste disposal, of healthcare mm -hmm. waste disposal. And I saw on your website that you there's a lot of involvement by stakeholders, non-government as well as government, to um, for alternative uh, processes other than incineration. And I know that there's a lot of energy to waste incinerations. And what's your thought on the energy to waste incinerations? And what are the alternatives that you are advocating for? Yeah, we've not been big fans of, of burning um, waste uh, to create power um, because it just accelerates this sort of throwaway economy and it continues to pollute dramatically into the environment, whether it's a medical waste incinerator or a pyrolysis unit or a solid waste incinerator. That's how we got started in this work. And we still believe that there's a whole set of alternative technologies um, that can address the waste, but we have to shrink the waste dramatically. Um, and so that's part of it. We need to reprocess so many more devices so that when, you know, after a surgery, a lot of what is not even been used, but it's been open is thrown away. It's not even been used or it's been used once. So reprocessing a lot of the things that, that are now being used, reusing things, recycling things that could be done. This isn't rocket science. Um, some systems uh, around the country are getting 45%, 50% recycling rates. It's not the only solution. And we need to move away from some uh, sort of worst in class materials like some of these toxic petrochemical plastics. So, I mean, it's a, it's a long answer, but there's alternative treatment technologies, but there's a lot of upstream uh, solutions that can reduce the amount of stuff that we actually use and the amount of stuff that we then need to either burn or deal with some other way. Mm. Mr. Cohen, we've come up to time. We are so grateful to you for your, your efforts, your long history in engagement in this important work, and we thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I'm, I'm interested if there are people that want to get engaged in, in this work in your network and continue to in, uh, become involved. We are, we want, we're looking for recruits. We want anybody who's interested, we'd love to find a place for you to, to participate, you know, in Boston and elsewhere. So uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Gary. Our next, our next Grand Browns webinar is Wednesday, October 18th at 12 noon. We look forward to seeing everyone.